on the clock or is it are you ready to start? Ah. So we can start. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is two system. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can you change the uh, slides just to know that it works? Welcome, good morning. Welcome to the first days of discussion. Uh, I would like to spend one word to introduce these three days because the format is going to be slightly different than other conferences you have experienced. So each session will have some short, very short lightning talks. These are meant to ignite the discussion. They are supposed to be provoking and uh, uh, light up questions, ideas, so they should be uh, the igniter for all the conversation that we are going to have uh, uh, after. For this reason, uh, we want the, uh, the talk not to be interrupted, so we will have uh, just uh, uh, one talk after the other without questions, but then there will be two hours of discussion. So I am uh, um, glad to introduce uh, uh, the first, uh, um, so the, the, the first session, maybe the first session of the day is uh, about uh, discussing uh, measurements uh, of uh, uh, quantum gravity effect in the lab, and uh, I let the speakers come into the into the stage. The first one is Marius Christodoulou, who is uh, uh, the power force behind this uh, KISS consortium. So let's also take this occasion to make a warm welcome. Uh, thanks to him. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's really a pleasure to see everybody getting together. OK, I start because we don't uh, have a lot of time. I will um, try to comply with the request to just uh, uh, give a, a spark for the discussion. So let me go very quickly. We start in 1957, uh, where the um, idea that it's going to be important at some point, conceptually, to think about uh, um, mediated entanglement through gravity came out, or, or at least... Uh, 
Okay, how about now? <clears throat> All right. So the idea that uh, mediated entanglement through gravity uh, is important to consider goes all the way back to 1957, where we have uh, Richard Feynman saying um, in the famed, uh, this is a famed Chapel Hill conference, that we're in trouble if we believe in quantum mechanics but don't quantize gravitational theory, mm -hmm. essentially saying that already if you look uh, at uh, Schrodinger's equation and you want to include the gravitational interaction, then you're talking about doing something with quantum gravity in some sense. Um, and one should think about designing an experiment which uses a gravitational link and at the same time shows quantum interference. Uh, note the, the, the use of gravitational link, which I find very um, say interesting that even 60 years ago there is a language that allures to uh, in exchange of quantum information. Now, uh, Lou Witten asked uh, what prevents this from becoming a practical experiment. And Feynman answered, uh, uh, well, you might argue this way, somewhere in your apparatus, this idea of probability amplitude has been lost. You do not need it anymore, so you drop it. The wave packet would be reduced or something, even though you do not know where it's reduced, it is reduced, and then you can do an experiment which distinguishes interfering alternatives from just plain odds, like with dice. So, uh, in modern parlance, what it says is that entanglement through the gravitational interaction seems to imply a quantized gravitational field. We are still not sure uh, what is the exact implication. The main trouble, the practical trouble, the experimental trouble from uh, realizing such an experiment is the coherence to the environment, which implies that the outcomes of measurements will be described by a probabilistic mixture. 63 years later, we may realistically hope to see this experiment done within a generation. So let me very briefly give you the context of why people are excited on the experimental side. Although I'm not an experimentalist, just to, since I'm also replacing Markus Aspelmeyer who couldn't make it, let me quickly say a few words. So there is a lot of excitement in the past years due to this, um, um, the rapid development of uh, two directions. Right, we have quantum and gravity, and the usual issue is how do you get an overlap of scales to do uh, phenomenology? Because quantum is for the very small, and uh, gravity is for the very large. So what you need to do is bring quantum mechanics to larger scales and learn how to measure gravity in smaller scales. So in the direction of uh, making bigger things become quantum mechanically, there has been, there has been there is rapid development in. Um, uh, of mechanics. So essentially what is being done here is that you take a particle that is not a fundamental particle. Um, here, these papers are talking about a billion atoms. It's not macroscopic either. We're talking about the mesoscopic scale. You trap it in a harmonic potential using uh, lasers, the so-called optical tweezers, and you make it go to its ground state. Um, to be precise, you make one degree of freedom out of all the 10 to the 9 degrees of freedom, the center of mass, degree of freedom, go to the ground state in the sense that it saturates the Heisenberg uncertainty, its momentum and position. On the other direction, um, what you have is the so-called precision gravity measurements where they're um, learning how to measure the gravitational force of small uh, masses. Now, this is, um, uh, this is an experiment that happened uh, last year in Vienna. It measured uh, the gravitational field of uh, a mass that is uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, five, ki 10 to the minus five kilograms, and uh, it is claimed that soon they will beat this record by um, three or four orders of magnitude. And the same goes for the direction uh, for, for the quantum direction. So this is um, essentially why there is excitement, just to give you very quickly the story that now we are here, this is mass in kilos of um, how big masses they can set to their ground state. And here on uh, um, how small masses they can measure the gravitational field. It is claimed that within a few years, there's gonna be a huge jump in both directions. Now, do we believe that? Yes, you can believe that because uh, it's very new and they are getting a lot of, they have a lot of margin uh, just by reduction of noise. I was showing in the previous slide 
um, this tunnel. So this is the experiment for measuring the small gravitational force. It's really a box. So we're really talking about tabletop experiment. And just by moving it to the tunnel, because before they were doing it in the basement and they were catching the gravity of trams passing and everything in the middle of the city, they get three orders of magnitude just by the reduction of noise. It's going to be the same for the quantum experiment. So this is why people are excited about this possibility of seeing, uh, of doing quantum gravity phenomenology in the lab, because it is realistic to hope that there's going to be an overlap of scales uh, um, within the decade. However, this is a very big, however, this is all in the limited sense that you have these two separate setups. And on the quantum side, you're just setting, setting something in its ground state. What you need to do afterwards is actually set that degree of freedom in superposition. You have to keep the coherence long enough, which is this problem of the coherence that Feynman was talking about. And you have to put the two in one experiment and then do the whole thing. So um, people that understand these things are saying that before 20 years we cannot do it. So there is a parallel race, and this is what interests also theoreticians, that um, um, on one side is the experimental push to actually do the experiment. On the other side, it's to think of more feasible or smarter uh, protocols of smarter measurements, etc. And there is uh, 400 papers the last five years are coming up with various ideas. Now, um, okay, let me very quickly give you a simple version of uh, this experiment, uh, what it is all about. So what we have here is uh, two masses, each one set in a path superposition. Um, it has an embedded degree of freedom, a spin, which is manipulated by a magnetic field so that you make this path superposition. You start in a product state of the spin, and through the gravitational interaction, you get a phase, which means that the final state of the spins is going to be entangled. All right? For generally speaking, if uh, the phase is not a multiple of 2 pi, you will get non-zero entanglement entropy, where you started with a zero entanglement entropy. Now, assuming a local interaction, this is the argument. If entanglement is detected, the argument goes, we must conclude that the gravitational field cannot be a classical field. Now, I have this in red because there's some confusion created that I want to, to really insist on, that the whole thing has any importance for quantum gravity, if it has, assuming the local interaction. If you are not assuming the local interaction, there is really uh, nothing to say. Uh, because the experiment is going to operate in the Newtonian regime, it is sufficient to, in order to guess where is the regime where you expect entanglement to be created, to use these formulas, which are really uh, just Newton's law we, le we learned in high school. And then you say, well, the phase is going to be energy times time divided by h bar. And that is all. Uh, but careful, this is just to do a very rough estimate of where is the regime where you expect to see entanglement. This has nothing to do with the importance of doing this experiment. One way to think about this experiment, I mean, what the trick is, why it's smart, is that it forces one to either conclude what I have in red, that um, um, the gravitational field cannot be a classical field, in particular that it must be able to carry quantum information, or your abandoned locality. It puts you in this dilemma, you assume out the abandoned locality, and you're stuck with this. Now, the question that people care about um, in the debate that has been going on on the theoretical side the past two years is fine, let's place ourselves in this case where we're assuming a local interaction. So this um, entanglement is mediated somehow locally by something here in the middle, which is uh, the field. Then how do you describe this concretely? And surprisingly, you expect to see this in books, open a book and see how this is done, but it's not so obvious and people are very confused. Um, and that's why traditions are interested in this, essentially. Now, All right, let me just caricature the debate. I'm probably not doing justice to people. Some of the people are also here. I don't want to put words in the mouth of anybody. 
but this is the way to say the story. You have on one side a claim that uh, this has nothing to do with quantum gravity, um, which is essentially saying even assuming locality, so again, if you're not assuming locality, there isn't really anything to say, the true degrees of freedom are not participating. There is no mediation to speak of. Um, this all arises due to a constraint, etc. On the other extreme, um, there is, these two positions are related. There is to say that, yes, it's just Newton's law, but Newton's law can be understood as the exchange of virtual gravitons, as we know very well from quantum field theory, and so that's the mediator, it's the virtual gravitons. Um, which would be a bit too much, in my opinion, because it would mean that we would be witnessing the existence of virtual gravitons because before we actually detect gravity. Now, in the middle grounds, there is uh, this idea that um, what it implies, what we learn from seeing this effect, is that quantum information can be carried by the non-relative part. In particular, there is a subtle uh, implication um, to be taken here. The point is that if the mediator is the usual radiation, if you want to say that it's gravitons or photons, on-shell gravitons or photons, then the effect should not take place in the first place because you would lose interference because this would uh, mean uh, you're decohering to the environment. So, okay, it's, if you want to say it's, there is something that is carrying this quantum information, but it cannot be what we call photons or gravitons, typically, uh, then what is this? Um, a related stance is really to say that it somehow implies detection of onshore gravitons, but it's not very clear how. These are indirect arguments, both that I'm citing here. So, it's essentially saying, uh, yeah, okay, it should still be gravitons, but there must be something else uh, going on that um, um, that means that the, the quantum information is being carried, but we still do not lose uh, coherence. It's not clear how that works. And there is another middle ground, which is where I have had contributions with co-authors, mo most of which are in this room, which is to say that um, uh, what it implies, seeing the effect, is a macroscopic superposition of space times. In particular, under the assumption of locality, a straightforward implication is that in terms of gauge invariant quantities, entanglement arises causally, in the sense that the phases that cause the entanglement do not build up instantaneously. Now, this is mainly the second paper here. What this, what this does is um, um, essentially say that the first two stances, the two extremes, do not take into account that uh, entanglement is not arising instantaneously. Um, so it's more of an answer to these first two stances. But it still does not resolve the puzzle of, okay, but what is it? How do we describe this excitation that is carrying the quantum information? And this is related to LSCT, but I want to stress that this, the puzzle is there irrespectively of LSCT. It has nothing to do in particular with quantum gravity. Already we do not know how to describe this local propagation of quantum information in this physical regime in uh, quantum electrodynamics, which is a very well established physical theory. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much for the organizer, and thank you, Mario, for the very nice uh, summary talk. So I will give a theoretical account for the gravity-induced entanglement experiment, and the work is with two wonderful collaborators, Flaminia Giacomini and Carlo Ravelli. So 
let us look at the experiment again. Initially, we have two massive particles sitting on a table, and they have some internal spin degree of freedom. Hence, it goes through a homogeneous magnetic field to split to each particle split to a superposition of different spin, and the spin degree of freedom is coupled with the location of the particle. At that time, the two branches of the superposition are in the tensor product. Then we're going through the time evolution for one second or more or less. In the end, we go through the interferometer again to test whether there's entanglement between the two states. Namely, whether there's a non-trivial phase built up due to the, the closer distance of the branches in the superposition. So, as Mario just introduced, there has been very active debate in the field, and in particular, there's still open question to be answered as what exactly is the degree of freedom which mediate this entanglement production and carry the quantum information in the experiment. And how to describe the superposition of quantum geometry in the regime of this experiment? What are the minimum theoretical assumptions we could give in order to have a quantum description. So this is our two cents. We are mostly focusing on this period of the entanglement accumulation. That is, when the charge are already static relative to each other, all the radiation has dissipated away, fields are in the equilibrium. Hence, we could simply solve the Schrodinger equations to have a quantum state description of the fields. And as this is not a superposition of black holes, the linearized regime is sufficient for the anal analysis of the experiment. Also, I want to emphasize that we want to fix the gauge minimally. We only fix the temporal part and leaves all the spatial part unfixed, because now we are studying the interplay between the Coulombic field or Newtonian field with this radiative modes. So it is important to keep the gauge to be the minimum. As you will see, it's very illuminating to parallel analyzing the linearized gravity together with the electromagnetism to compare the similarity and the difference. So now let us look at the simplest case, the electromagnetic field generated by a charge at rest. In the temporal gauge A equal to zero, the canonical analysis of the theory is defined by the following Hamiltonian with the Gauss law we are familiar with. The Hamiltonian is E squared plus B squared. And under this gauge, electric field and the spatial part of the vector potential are canonically conjugate with each other. In the representation which diagonalize the field operator A in the vector uh, potential representation, the form of the Gauss law in the momentum space is the following form, when the Gauss law is acting on the state strongly. What it tells us mathematically is that the state is independent of the longitudinal mode, as you can see the contraction with the momentum. And it is hence it's constant along the gauge orbit. So as we know, Gauss constraint is ensures the gauge invariant of the quantum state, quantum state. Now we have a charge. The modification is very simple. We need to turn on the longitudinal modes of the uh, quantum state. So the picture at the left I shows the frame dependent split of what is a longitudinal mode in green and the transverse component. And it can be calculated by a projector onto the orthogonal direction of the momentum. So the, for the vacuum, it is a Gaussian state of the transverse mode, because it's independent with the longitude, you know? And when we write it as the curl of A in the magnetic field, it's the second line of expression. This expression you can find in the literature about this quantum state description for electric magnetic field. And this, as you can see, is a non-local. It resembles the non-locality of the vacuum state of the quantum field. Now, with charge, the solution for the Gauss law is with the following form. So this exponential is a linear shift, adding a linear term on A contracted with momentum. 
it tells us that we need to averaging of all the longitudinal mode on the momentum space. And when we fully transform to the representation of electric fields, it is very illuminating to write in the form as a Gaussian state of electric field with acting a delta function acting on it to project it on the solution of the Gauss law. So as it is the eigenstate of Hamiltonian, we could compute the energy such field is taking. And the, the result is, as you expected, it's a self-energy of a par particle, the quantum state of the particle, which is the, the Coulomb potential integrated over the whole space. OK, now it comes to the quantum source. In general, for the stationary quantum source, we can think of it as a superposition of the charge density eigenstates as the following form. Hence, essentially, the Coulomb field it is taking and together with the charge, it lives on the tensor product of the charge and the Coulomb field. Note that this is not the tensor product over cutting of the space. Hence, the quantum state of electromagnetic field is entangled with the quantum source through the information about the charge density. And we can write explicitly as when we have a superposition of all n branches of localized charge, the full quantum state of electromagnetic field together with the charge in the X representation is, this is the full state. So now let us come back to our experiment. Let's assume that the closest branch, the distance is, with, is D, and the particle with this closest branch feels each other's energy. Hence, under time evolution, through that the energy we have just calculated, the Hamiltonian evolution gives us the relative phase between this closest branch of the quantum state. So what exactly are the degree of freedom which mediated this entanglement. We think that um, it is better to analyze as a two step. The first step is this non-inertial motion of the charge going through the magnetic field to settle it down as these four branches of superposition. Through this process, electromagnetic field will be mediated. And such mediation updated the nearest neighbor of what's the change of my Coulomb field. And when everything is settled down through the Hamiltonian evolution, it is picking up the phase. In this process, the mediator of the entanglement is the full quantum state as we have just showed the slides before. Due to the time, let me give a brief sketch of the gravitational case and the comparison of the character. So we consider the linear perturbation of gravitational field around the Minkowski spacetime. For Hamiltonian analysis, we do the 3 plus 1 decomposition. And the n and the ni are the h0 mu component of the perturbation. Uh, so for export, this is called the lapse and the shift. It identifies, um, the it identifies the different point on the time slicing of the different uh, spatial hypersurface. And so the N and the NI are the gauge we are going to fix in analogy to electromagnetism. And our dynamical variable is this HIJ perturbation over the flat space metric. We do not fix any gauge for this spatial perturbation. And the Hamiltonian for linearized gravity becomes a very simple form. The Hamiltonian part is a quadratic in terms of the perturbation and it's only written in terms of the transverse variable of the metric perturbation. So it is only on the, the yellow plane. Now we have four constraints. Three vector constraints ensures the spatial diffeomorphism invariant. And then we have the gravity Gauss law that's uh, as how yesterday teach us. And it's written very simple as a Poisson equation for this static charge. And similar as the electromagnetic case, the vector constraint tells us the physical state is independent with the longitudinal mode. And then 
we very similar as electromagnetism, we will have a Gaussian state of the transverse mode and then impose the scalar constraint to project it on the, the precise place of the gauge orbit. Let us compare the character of linearized gravity and electromagnetism. So we are working on the temporal gauge and the dynamical, the canonical pair uh, that define the phase space are as following. In gravity, there are six degree of freedom in the spatial metric with four constraints. So there's two physical degree of freedom. In electromagnetism, we have one constraint. And analogy to the Gauss law in the vector potential representation in electromagnetism in the gravity is the vector constraint. And they both tell us the state is a Gaussian of the transverse mode. The scalar constraint when we have a static source is analogic, is mathematically analogic to the Gauss law in the electric field representation. But there is a substantial difference. Is that in electromagnetism, when we have a source the matter, what it turns on is the longitudinal mode of electromagnetic field. Well, in gravity, to turn on longitudinal mode, uh, here the matter source turns on the trace of the transverse mode. And to have the longitudinal mode, you need to consider away from the Newtonian limit. OK, let's have a brief summary. So we provide a theoretical description for the gravity-induced entanglement experiment. The full state we have just solved for electromagnetic field or gravitational field is responsible for generating this entanglement. And I really want to emphasize that only consider the quantization of photon or graviton is not enough because we see that, that there is a genuine quantum effect coming from the Coulomb and Newtonian field, and such split is frame dependent. So the frame dependent part of the Coulomb field versus the uh, radiative degree of freedom Please also see the poster there next to the coffee, the work done by Dane at all. Uh, it is a very nice work of showing the different cosy slides uh, corresponds to the different frame, hence it's a frame dependent split of the radiative field and the gauge potential. So as the gravity induced entanglement experiment is still technically not feasible in a, in a short future, so hopefully our effort of this quantum state formulation could help to search for the other novel experimental protocols that is not the gravity-induced entanglement to extract the inferable quantum feature of the gravitational field. This I will refer to Richard Hall's talk the next. So there are many interesting questions related to the quantum superposition of geometry one could study, such as like entanglement entropy, and also for the audience in this conference, this is a nice uh, simple test ground to study quantum causal structure in the linearized regime. As you can see, this is exactly the configuration of gravitational switch. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. So as uh, Ling Ching just said, I'm going to be uh, presenting the many different approaches to testing quantum gravity in the lab, so not just concentrating on this uh, BMV experiment. So I'll be doing this at lightning speed, okay, so it's just going to be a, a very, very quick overview of the, of the landscape. Okay, so by test of quantum gravity, what I mean here is uh, tests that look for a feature that we expect all natural quantum gravity theories to possess, okay? So this is the ability to entangle two matter objects. 
as he referred. So what these tests are not are tests of a uh, specific feature. Yeah, that was my thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So they're, they're not a test of a, um, a specific feature of, a, say, a particular set of quantum gravity theories, uh, such as discrete time, which we'll hear about uh, after this talk, or um, test of a specific uh, feature of a particular set. Uh, sorry, a particular alternative to quantum gravity, uh, such as semi-classical gravity. Okay. So in the beginning of this. Uh, very general approach, as, uh, as Marius has said, there was Feynman. I like had this uh, godlike idea about how you could tell uh, that gravity obeys quantum theory in the lab um, by looking, uh, well, in modern terms, to see if gravity can entangle two matter objects. But then after that, there were a few proposals uh, loosely based around this kind of idea. Um, but the one that really shined the light on uh, what this all meant and how to make this feasible uh, was that of uh, Sugato and his uh, collaborators, and uh, Jara and uh, Vlatko, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the, uh, the B and V experiment after uh, some of its celestial creators. Um, so, yeah, we've already heard this a couple of times, but let me just say it again because maybe I'll say something a bit uh, a bit different to last time. So, if we um, in this experiment you start with two masses in a superposition of spins. Uh, then you take it for a stern gerlach device, uh, so that now you have a macroscopic superposition of spins uh, of these states. Then you let them um, gravitationally interact, you bring them back together, and uh, if you've got uh, an entangled state of spins, then this uh, should provide evidence that you have quantum gravity. Okay, so in the five to six years uh, since this proposal, um, I still think this is the most elegant realization of uh, Feynman's idea. And of course, I'm not just saying that to uh, appease the, the chair here. Um, but in those five years, there have been other proposals for testing quantum gravity in the lab, um, inspired by this BMV, and uh, that's what I want to focus on. OK, so why? Why, uh, why keep on going? Why not just stop at the uh, BMV proposal? Was well, because testing quantum gravity is extremely challenging because gravity uh, is so weak. So although we, uh, so although the BMV absolutely revolutionised, uh, yeah, I was a bit bored on the plane over here. Sorry. Um, so as the uh, the BMV has absolutely revolutionised uh, the feasibility of quantum gravity experiments, but uh, it is still very challenging. Um, so it'd be great if we had some more ideas on how to test quantum gravity uh, to bring us closer to this new era. Okay, so let's uh, briefly look at some of the challenges involved in the BMV. So uh, entanglement is maximizing experiments when this phase difference uh, here is of order one, where m is the uh, mass of the objects, t is the time for which they are coherent, uh, delta x is the superposition width, and uh, d is the uh, distance, the smallest distance between the paths. So in the original paper, uh, phase of order one uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is achieved when um, this mass is 10 to minus 14 kilograms, at the coherence time is two and a half seconds, delta x is 250 micrometers, and d is 200 micrometers, which is the distance of which gravity is uh, 10 times greater than the Casimir force between the objects. So if you compare that to the current record on creating superposition, uh, massive, massive superposition states, uh, then this is with molecules through diffraction gratings, and in that case, the mass is 10 to the minus 23 kilograms, the time is 10 milliseconds, and delta x is 300 nanometers. So clearly from this perspective, we're still quite some way away. Now, of course, saying that, this uses a different technology to that proposed in the uh, BMV with the stern girl axe. So that's great because it means we could potentially make a dramatic change to these numbers very soon. And we have reasons to believe that that could be the case, as, as Maria said. But it also means that this is a relatively unexplored direction for creating macroscopic suppositions. And so it could throw up some surprises as we try and increase uh, these current experimental values. OK, so the reason that it's uh, so challenging 
to increase these current experimental numbers, uh, as Mario said, is, is decoherence. Okay, so that's how to hide your quantum system so that it's not seen by its environment. Okay, which is uh, very challenging for gravity uh, because it is so weak. Okay, All right. So, okay, the BMV may in the end, uh, you know, it's, it's very challenging, but it may in the end, of course, turn out to be the best we can do. But let's now um, explore the landscape, uh, see if we can find a pot of gold, see if we can find a new approach uh, that is less challenging. Okay, so I split all the current uh, approaches out there into four distinct categories. So these are modifications to the original BMV proposal, experiments that all flow like the BMV, look for entanglement of macroscopic solids, experiments that look for entanglement with other systems, and experiments that look for signatures other than entanglement. Okay, so since the original BMV proposal, uh, there have been a number of efforts to try and improve it. So one of these uh, is to place a thin conducting plate between the microspheres, which uh, cuts off the Casimir force between them. Um, so this then means that you can reduce uh, the mineral distance by an order of magnitude, uh, which then means that you can lower the mass by one or two orders of magnitude. So this is a, a fantastic result, and already brings the experiment that bit uh, closer to realization. You can also get an advantage by, rather than having the two masses all along uh, one line, as in the uh, original proposal, uh, we now place the two masses in two planes next to each other, uh, so that all the paths are closer together. Um, so for example, if uh, we work in the regime of uh, a small distance, um, then you can gain a factor of two here, because there are two paths that pick up uh, the same phase. Uh, so you could use this to reduce the, uh, or cut the, the coherence time by half, for example. Okay, you can also um, get an improvement uh, by uh, increasing the number of superposition paths and uh, the number of masses, um, particularly at high decoherence rates. Um, but that comes at the expense of um, requiring more measurements to uh, verify the entanglements and also um, you know, complicating the experiment. Different ways to measure entanglement have also been looked at uh, compared to the original proposal, uh, which can provide a, a verify entanglement at slightly shorter times now. And uh, the sometimes controversial topic uh, of weak values has also been looked at uh, to boost the BMV signal, um, which, if possible, presumably also comes at the cost of requiring more measurements, but uh, you know, it's a very intriguing idea. Okay, so those were some modifications to the BMV, and uh, they may perhaps gain you uh, two, e two or three orders of magnitude, perhaps, but um, you know, we're still some way away. So what about other experiments look for entanglement of macroscopic solids? So one of these is very similar to the BMV, except that rather than having two masses in the superposition of two locations, uh, now you've put two masses uh, in traps, and the uh, width of the wave function uh, represents how delocalized they are. So now you can improve the um, signal, for example, by quantum squeezing or anti-squeezing uh, the ground state. So this is perhaps closer in spirit to uh, current experiments on quantum solids, uh, which is very nice. Uh, but Marcus Aftermeyer has shown that uh, for the simplest version of this experiment, uh, the rate of entanglement generation is actually the same as in the BMV, and that you'd expect to require similar quantitative improvements in technology. A sort of cross between the BMV and the previous proposal has also been considered, uh, where now you have a, a small mass, they have a superposition of two locations, that's mass A, and that couples gravitationally to uh, mass C, a larger mass in a trap, and that then couples non-gravitationally to an anticubic uh, system B, and A and B are not currently interacting. So as this full system evolves, uh, it was found that at certain times, this mass C gets completely decoupled from the rest of the system, and then you just have entanglement uh, between, between A and B, which are these uh, solid lines here. So most interestingly, they say that uh, the peaks of this entanglement are not affected by the uh, temperature of C. It is only that the um, time for which A and B get entangled uh, gets reduced. So these are these different colors here. So that might mean that we don't need the challenge of calling mass C exactly to the ground state, which is a, a very nice result. And perhaps it also suggests that uh, entanglement swapping uh, could be another way to boost the signal in the BMV. Okay, so there are also experiments that uh, now take the masses to be mirrors uh, in optical cavities. Uh, so now the entanglement between the mirrors due to their gravitational interaction uh, can result, for example, in conditional squeezing of the light in the cavities. So interestingly here, uh, the squeezing effect 
no longer explicitly depends on the mass of the mirrors, um, but it perhaps enters implicitly, as uh, here you need radiation pressure limited cavities uh, with a low frequency mechanical mass, which often means large masses, and uh, that has not been achieved yet. Um, but, you know, although the technology is not quite there, uh, we do know that these type of optimal mechanical experiments have been very useful in testing gravity in the past, uh, such as LIGO, of course. Okay, so all those previous experiments look for entanglement of macroscopic solids, which we know will be challenging. So what about entanglement with other systems? So one idea is uh, to have the B and V again, but uh, now you look for entanglement of a, a superposition of two helium superfluids. Uh, so these are in, both in a superposition of two locations. So a challenge here would be that uh, superfluids are usually surrounded by very large thermal components. So you'd expect that to lead to rapid decoherence of the state. However, that's not the case for quantum gases. And we've already quantum squeezed by 100 times quite high masses of cold atoms and achieved quite high mass coherent BCs. So these numbers look quite uh, good for testing quantum gravity or promising. But compared to quantum solids, um, these are, of course, weakly interacting systems. Uh, so that means, for example, it's, it's an open question on how much these numbers uh, can be pushed further. OK, and uh, now for something uh, completely different. So what about not, using, uh, not looking for entanglement as evidence of quantum gravity? So another signature of quantum gravity that we explored is non-Gaussianity. The idea here is that, uh, based on results of quantum field theory, only a quantum, not classical, uh, theory of gravity could entangle, uh, could, sorry, could uh, cause the uh, field state of matter to change from a Gaussian state to a non-Gaussian state. And uh, based on recent results suggesting that contextuality is equivalent to uh, beginner negativity, uh, this also implies that uh, for bosonic systems at least, uh, only a quantum field of gravity can change the quantum contextuality of the field state of matter. And that's something we want to explore further in KISS 2. So a possible advantage of this approach is that it uses just a, it just needs a single system, uh, potentially simplifying experiments. And we also found some evidence that, um, unlike entanglements, it could be used to rule out non-local as well as local fields of classical gravity, which may sound unnecessary. Um, but there is some debate that uh, natural classical gravity theories are in fact non-local. Okay, so we developed a test of um, quantum gravity that now looks for increases in non-Gaussianity of a single BEC. So that just requires a single object, but that then comes at the cost of um, needing quite precise magnetic fields in order to distinguish between the electromagnetic and the gravitational self-interaction of the BEC. So that would be a challenge. And another challenge is that we'd need to squeeze BECs by much more than they have been so far. So a bit like the quantum solid experiment. But we are working on a proposal that hopefully won't involve such challenges. OK, so the course, there are some, uh, uh, the course, some other ideas that I haven't had time to probably go through, uh, such as whether increases in quantum coherence could also be used to evidence quantum gravity. Uh, so here, um, there's some debate that the uh, additional requirements that you often need to make this a test of quantum gravity are uh, too strong and are violated by uh, certain um, fairly natural fields of classical gravity, such as classical gravity with stochastic fields, and other ideas that unfortunately I don't have time for. OK, so I've shown you quite a lot of proposals there. And uh, in the end, I find it very difficult personally to say which is the best, um, which is the most feasible, essentially because they all require advancements in technology and often in different fields. So it may be a question of which experimental field or technique makes the most dramatic change in the near future. OK, last slide, I promise. OK, so, um, you know, although testing quantum gravity is going to be challenging, to me, it no longer, no longer looks impossible. And I feel like we're constantly getting closer to where we need to be uh, with all these uh, new ideas out there. But as, as Marius alluded to earlier, if we want to test quantum gravity very, very soon, then um, we're probably going to need some more ideas from both theory and experiment. So that could be a challenge for later, uh, given this unique coming together of minds of those in quantum information and quantum gravity, uh, can we come up with any clever new ideas uh, for testing quantum gravity? Okay, right. 
that's it. I'll just leave you with some questions later in the talk. Okay, thank you. It's no, it's um, desktop also. I've got some control treatment. Yeah, yeah, I did it. You're working out yet? Yeah. All right, good morning. Okay, can you hear me well? Okay, um, thanks to the organizers first for the organization of this conference. I enjoy it very much and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about discreteness because I think there is a lot of confusion about the role of discreteness in quantum theory. So I will tell you what I understand of it and also share my own confusions so that maybe we can get all confused. And, but I will ask some specific questions over which I would be glad to have your thoughts uh, during the discussions afterwards. So the, the reason I think why there is a confusion in the first place is because the word quantum suggests that the theory is fundamentally linked to discreteness. And that's at least true for historical reasons. But there is a question there which is, is discreteness an essential feature of quantum theory? And I don't know what you think in the audience, but I've, the opinion on that question is somehow a bit divided in the community. Some people would say, yeah, of course, discreteness is an essential feature. But some would say, well, no, because we can do quantum mechanics with only continuous objects. So I think there are also good arguments to say that there is a fundamental continuity in quantum physics. And here are some of the arguments. One is to say that the amplitude is a complex number and it can take just any value. And that's an essential ingredient of the quantum theory. Complex numbers are perfectly smooth. That's Hilbert spaces, you know. 
Another argument is to say that not all observables have a discrete spectrum. If you are in a Hilbert space with infinite dimensions, then actually most of the operators do have a continuous spectrum, like the position operator. Another argument comes from QFT. Well, in this context, then the notion of particles does not really make sense and should re be really replaced by the notion of a field. Everything is smooth and continuous. And when we think of discreteness as quantum jumps, then now with decoherence, we can explain uh, these quantum jumps in a continuous way, continuous evolution. So here is the first question. Is discreteness an essential feature of quantum theory? And let's make some history to try to understand how, how this question arises. Let's go back two centuries ago with, in chemistry with John Dalton. He's written this atomic theory, and uh, that's because he's noticing that the stoichiometric coefficients in the chemical reactions, they, they are actually natural numbers. And so that's the way discreteness arises in physics. But is this quantum? I think most people here would believe that this is not quantum. This is just the existence of atoms. And we can perfectly have a classical theory of atoms. There's nothing quantum here. At the end of the century, there's then Thomson, and he shows that cathode rays are actually made of particles that he call electron. So now he shows that there is the electricity fluid, which is actually made of discrete things, discrete particles. Is this quantum? Usually we say, no, this is not quantum, this is also something classical, because quantum theory really appears with Planck. So Planck is able to explain black body radiation by assuming that there are quanta of energy. And so now what he is saying is that energy is not a continuous fluid, it is discrete, it comes in some packets, and this is the energy. And, and now we say, well, this is quantum. And we say this is quantum because, because there's h-bar. So h-bar is basically what we call quantum. But in what sense is it any different from what's just below, above? And then five years later, there's Einstein in 1905. He's writing actually two papers about discreteness. The first paper is about the photoelectric effect. And he's using Planck hypothesis to try to explain the photoelectric effect. And that, we say well, it's quantum. But, but there's a second paper by Einstein on discreteness, and that's about Brownian motion. And he's somehow using Brownian motion, which is observed in microscopes, as evidence for the existence of atoms. And this, usually, we'd say that's not quantum. That's classical. And about 10 years later, there's Millikan that comes, and he's also doing two experiments related to discreteness. The first is about um, it's just following the works of Thomson is computing. Well, it's not actually computing. I should have written this is me it's a measurement. He's measuring the electric charge in the old drop experiment. And so he's checking by that way that indeed the electric charge of the old drops comes in, in a quantized way, discrete way. And soon later, is, um confirms Einstein prediction of the photoelectric effect. And that's a quantum thing. So here, well, we see things are very entangled, whether in all this discreteness, which is popping up at this moment of history, what is really quantum and what is just classical. And, and maybe this confusion is maybe part of the reason why quantum mechanics the, was so, so so long to come about. In the old theory of quanta, maybe it's there where physicists were starting to realize that discreteness is everywhere, but it was hard to disentangle what kind of discreteness this was. Another thing nowadays, well, not people, not many people are trying to explain why the electric charge is discrete, but I think that's a relevant question to ask. Why is the electric charge really discrete? And as far as I know, there's only just one explanation. It's not really an explanation, actually. It's by Dirac. It's an old argument saying that if you have magnetic monopoles, then the electric charge must be quantized. 
but we do not have magnetic monopoles so far. That's not really an explanation for the discreteness of the charge. So I think this is the way I understand uh, the story, is that we must, be, we must be careful and we must distinguish um, two things. The first, one thing is to say that the number of degrees of freedom is finite, and this is discretization, this classical discreteness. Another thing is to say that the number of the possible values of a degrees of freedom is finite. And this is having a dis discrete spectrum for an operator, and that's quantum. So let me take an example that was inspired by a discussion with Laurent Fredel. It's quantum hydrodynamics. You take a superfluid, like helium-4, and, and you have two kinds of discreteness. One, this is what you see on the picture here, you have many holes, which correspond to vortices, and you can count the vortices in your fluid, these are topological defects. And, and so this, this is a kind of classical discreteness. But there's another way discreteness appears, and that's really quantum, is to say that the vortices are quantized. This means that if I take uh, the, the vorticity, which is basically the circulation of the velocity around the loop, it comes as a multiple of Planck constant. So in the old formulation of quantum theory, I mean Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, this discreteness of quantum mechanics goes to the discreteness of space-time. Basically, we say that the areas um, in the in, 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 in the phase uh, sorry the discreteness of phase space yeah the areas in the phase space are discrete and there is a fundamental unit of a, of action and this is the Planck constant. There's another way uh, it has been formulated later, and that's quantum mechanics, but somehow what's equivalent is to say just that we have operators and the spectrum is, is discrete. But if this is really the discreteness of quantum mechanics, then how do we explain that there are some observables which have a continuous spectrum, like right? you take the position. And so maybe some people in quantum gravity would say, well, if uh, the spectrum of um, the position operator is continuous, that's is just an artifact of the fact that we are treating the background space-time as something continuous. But if we want really to talk about quantized positions, we should really go to quantum gravity and maybe there there will be a discrete spectrum for the position operator. So what kind of discreteness can we expect in quantum gravity? One of the first attempts, I think, to, to put true discreteness in, in quantum theory of gravity is by Penrose with the spin networks. And what he's trying to do is to recover the geometry of, of 3D space directions from an algebra of quantum observables, which are the angular momentum. And these spin networks, they have been reused later in loop quantum gravity, where we have just two levels of discreteness. One, is that we are discretizing space-time on a graph, which will be called the, 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 the spin network, but that's only a truncation of the degrees of freedom of general relativity to be able to compute finite quantities. And then another level of discreteness is when, when looking at the spectrum of the area operator, and that's the most celebrated result of loop quantum gravity, uh, which is that it comes, the, the, this spectrum is discrete. That, that's the formula. There are other approaches, and maybe I, I don't know them very well, so I will not say much. Just, for instance, in causal set theory, uh, the theory is discrete, but by construction, we have a graph, and I'm not sure this is kind of quantum discreteness, it's different. So, that's really on the theoretical side, but what about experiments? Is there any experimental signature for the discreteness of space-time? Well, if space-time is discrete, then we should see a violation of the Lorentz invariance. And there are many experiments going on trying to, to, to see this violation. And so far, it has not been observed. But anyway, uh, 
we don't really expect this, maybe from uh, discreteness of uh, quantum gravity. That was argued, for instance, by Hovelli and Speciale, because uh, it's very similar to the discrete spectrum of the angular momentum. Uh, Al was saying it yesterday in his lecture. Like we can have, a, you can have a continuous set of directions, but if you fix one set of direction, one direction, then the energy uh, of uh, the, the different levels of the angular momentum are discrete. And this does not violate the invariance or under S2. Another uh, possibility, maybe, is this proposal by uh, Alejandro Perez and Daniele Sudarsky, um, in which they suggest that we could explain the cosmological constant by a fundamental granularity, Planckian granularity of space time. And I think that's very original and, in a sense, quite convincing when you look at the calculations. And so, in a sense, observing in the cosmological, cosmological constant would be already uh, probing uh, the Planckian granularity of space-time. And now I want to talk on my last slide about possible tabletop experiments. It's maybe a bit wild as a proposal, but this is something I've been working on with Andrea Di Biagio and Marios Christodoulou, based on an original idea by uh, Carlo Rovelli and Marios. And so it's very simple. Here's the, the setup. You, you, you have um, a gravitational field, and consider that this is constant, and you have a mass, m, that you put in a superposition You have a mass m that you put in a superposition, 0 plus 1, superposition of, of spin, but that becomes a superposition in space time. And so you have two branches, one up, one down, and the two branches experience a different gravitational potential. And this is going to create a phase between the two branches. And so when you recombine, you have this phase, which is delta phi. And this phase delta phi is due to the gravitational field in which. It is embedded. This is the expression that you get for the phase when you do the computation. So you have the mass of the test particle divided by the Planck mass. And then you have a delta tau divided by Planck time. And delta tau is the difference of proper times between the two branches. Okay, because the two branches experience, since the gravitational, the gravitational potential is different, time flows differently in the upper branch and the lower branch. It goes slower in the lower branch. And that's why you, the two proper times in the two branches are not quite the same. There's no difference. This is delta tau. And now, the, the funny thing is that um, what we are doing in this paper is that for a reasonable range of parameters, we can have the difference of proper time to be close to Planck time. And Planck time is very small, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. And so the thing is that if, if this difference of proper time has some discreteness, like it is proportional to a multiple integer of the Planck time, then maybe such a kind of an ex experiment could be able to see this discreteness. But do we really expect such a discreteness in uh, quantum gravity? That's a question for you. Thanks. Well, this closes uh, the first uh, set of, uh, of uh, lightning talks. Uh, I hope you had a lot of uh, ideas out of them. So it's time now for have a little break. Um, enjoy the coffee break. And you can uh, start the discussions in the coffee break. And we will bring them into the discussion uh, in uh, 20, 25 minutes. <laughs>